Hi, I'm Joe Trindle, President of the Board of Directors at Ernest Thompson Seton Institute. Joining me today in presenting our featured guest is Dr. Julie Seton, granddaughter of Ernest Thompson Seton and our Secretary Treasurer at the Institute. Hello there. The Ernest Thompson Seton Institute is pleased to present this webcast series, Seton's Descendants, Inspiration and Reflection. Ernest Thompson Seton's legacy lives on in his art, writings, and his values. Between 1860 and 1946 was a period of enormous global change. Living through that period, Ernest Thompson Seton was influenced by unbridled urbanization and industrialization inspiring him to learn, preserve, and educate others about our vanishing natural world. He also developed a deep appreciation for the values and customs of the first peoples of the Americas, inspiring and educating others to learn, appreciate, and preserve these vanishing treasures. Founder of Woodcraft Indians and a pioneer of scouting, Seton focused his efforts on educating youth and in so doing, continues inspiring the inquisitive youth in all of us. Today, three quarters of a century after Seton's passing, his work remains relevant in our changing world. We have the wonderful opportunity for some of Ernest Thompson Seton's family to share their reflections on this great man's legacy. Thank you for joining us. We hope that you too will be inspired to learn more about Ernest Thompson Seton and expand your knowledge and active role in caring for the natural world. The Ernest Thompson Seton Institute is dedicated to preserving and promoting Seton's legacy by inspiring curiosity and respect for nature and humanity in our changing world. Visit us at www.etseatoninstitute.org. Without further ado, we're pleased to introduce our featured guest, Dr. Clemency Coggins, granddaughter of Ernest Thompson Seton, who is joining us from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Dr. Coggins, Professor Emerita of Archaeology and Art History at Boston University, is a recipient of the Archaeological Institute of America's Gold Medal for Distinguished Archaeological Achievement for her incredible lifetime accomplishments in the archaeological sciences and preservation of the antiquities. Dr. Coggins, thank you for joining us today. I think the first thing that we would like to ask is, um, Clemency, please describe your, your family relationship to Ernest Thompson Seton. How are you related? He, he was my mother's father. I, I certainly heard about him all the time growing up, but he was not present. Some of those stories that you heard about him, could you share some of those with us? I think... Uh, I, this isn't exactly a story, but I, I think that he, he was always very sorry that his only child was a girl. Mm -hmm. At least my mother always had that feeling. And he married, certainly he, had, he married a very strong woman with her own life. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I don't know, my mother was, was uh, mostly taken care of by governesses. They were always traveling and she was all being cared for. She always considered herself the poor little rich girl. <laughs> oh, did she? I guess, she? I guess she sort of was. Yeah. I don't know at what age she started feeling that, but there was a book entitled that. <laughs> how did Seton's legacy and what you learned of him, how did that affect your life or others in your family? I think it would be because my mother was so involved in, in nature and animals and the outdoors, but she was not. So I can't say that that was it at all. I think uh, both parents were very strong and uh, had, had big plans in their lives. And she was actually sort of in many ways an impediment and she was cared for and they followed their own. Uh, it, you, you've seen all the early pictures of the ceremonies. There were the ceremonies and mama always had ceremonies. That was a very important part of our growing up. I mean, every holiday had complete rituals surrounding it followed every year. And mama was, became a total 
Anglophile and wrote several books about England, which was her way of reconnecting with what she felt was her, her own heritage. And so that's, that sort of, so that would be my connection was of course always through her. Remember, I don't think any stories really of her interacting in fact with her father. Some of those family traditions that you mentioned, what comes to mind that you recall from those? Well, particularly Christmas. <clears throat> Christmas was late, Christmas and New Year's were both laden with traditions, which we practiced every year, all of them. And I've imposed many of them on my family. And no, they will not continue, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes. Then, one of the, uh, I guess maybe it was New Year's, but I think we did it at Christmas. Uh, this was sort of an example of an old English tradition was blessing the silver. And I remember walking around the house. We had candles. She would have had candles blessing the silver. But she also, we also went outside and blessed the pump. Because <laughs> the pump was always breaking down. <laughs> <laughs> that was mama. <laughs> you know, there, there were lots of things like that. They were, they were wonderful, fun. And let me see, we acted out uh, Good King Wenceslas one year, uh, which I, all these things I think came through and from him, in which I was the, I had no speaking part. I was the poor man gathering the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in, in, in the in this, uh, Christmas Carol story. Uh, it was that sort of thing, which certainly came from him. These were all English things. She was, I, I was just uh, looking at what books I have of his and his books and realized I'm, and I still don't, can answer this, is uh, this novel. Uh, the Preacher of... Yeah, right. I mean, I've had it all these years and I've never read it or looked at it, but... Oh, no. 1917, it says. Wow. Wow, it's much earlier. I just started to read it, read it and realized how, how I mean, I've never thought of it in this way, particularly is how beautifully he writes. Writing about this uh, obscure northern Canadian northern town uh, is, is really quite beautiful. <laughs> have you uh, have you read any of his any of his early stories about uh, the Canadian frontier? Um, I an only Sandhill Stag. Okay. I dearly love, and uh, my husband and I went there um, oh, to Carberry. Oh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, and I had a wonderful time meeting them all, and they were all they were, we were all so excited. And um, we went and we hiked in the uh, sand hills around, right, that are very near Carberry. So I'm, I'm feeling very fond of that particular particular book. And, uh, There's a wonderful story that was published, uh, his first major work, he calls it, uh, was published in the Herald in Essex, was done as an article to encourage immigrants to come to Canada from England. Interesting, yeah. And it was done in 1883. So it was very early. And his first year when he was in the in the wilderness, if you will. In the, he, was, he was being paid for this as a kind of a, writing it to attract immigrants or? I don't know if he was paid, um, but I know that his friend R. Christie was responsible for getting it published. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm curious about what you said about your your traditions. Do you remember what kinds of I don't know, prayer you said over the silver? I don't know. We were blessing it. Uh, is that enough? So I mean, I, he was not a religious person, and so I think it was the tradition that we were doing rather than. Uh, that, that was what for my mother was most, was to be involved in something that was totally English or British tradition. And um, I, don't, I, I can't remember any words. I, however, I, I have 
an extraordinary volume, which is known as was known as the Holiday Book, which has we every year we um, she would write in it and she would put I'm sure all year all our holidays were productions, and there there would be. She would devote every year uh, pages to to thanks. Well, not all of them, yeah, to Thanksgiving, and to Christmas, and especially to New Year's, where we were all instructed to, to uh, have New Year's resolutions. And if you're too you're too young to have them, then she'll write them for you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> it, was, it was absolutely. And I have this incredible book, which. Um, did your grandmother participate in those? My grandmother, when she yeah, when she was around, she was she she was um, she would uh, Thanksgiving also, which is obviously not English, but that had its own complete rituals, and uh, and Christmas particularly, and and also to some degree New Year's, but New New Year's yes, in that there were these formal uh, resolutions. Um, which were my mother's idea, <laughs> uh, and even even Easter, and even she's even put thank and Thanksgiving, uh, and then I told you Halloween was a big production in that black room of the basement. Can you tell us tell us a little bit about that again? That was a great yeah. story. The, this house, uh, I, I like all his houses, where where the. Uh, <laughs> Tudor Pueblo, as you can imagine, and or Pueblo Tudor, which, uh, uh, and so plaster and everything was plaster, which meant it was always wet and damp, and everything was. And this basement room was very wet and damp, and it was covered by on the outside by earth. It was added to the basement somehow, so that obviously it was not part of the original plan. I don't know at what point they made it during Prohibition. I think I think it was. <laughs> and you went into this uh, room in the basement uh, with a door, and there were sort of these rickety shelves all around. And in front of the, the, the shelves right in front of you pulled away. And behind it, the floor, the regular plaster uh, wall, a uh, very rough plaster wall, you could pull it away and open it. And this, this room, which had no light or it was pitch black, was behind it, and uh, only use we used was for Halloween, to scare Jesus out of kids. Uh, <laughs> Mama really liked to scare people. I did not like being scared, but that that would be part of it. And uh, she, I guess, it was usually her would be be sitting there. And I mean, you would go in and you couldn't see anything. It was dark, and suddenly you would realize there was a figure sitting there in this room. Oh, so funny. And the figure was, um, would be wearing, you know, I have sort of long veily things. And uh, in front of the figure would be some sort of a table. Uh, and on it would be apples. And in the apples, there were fortunes. And so the figure would, I mean, it scared out of there a lot of minds, everything, would point to one of the apples and the figure would, first child, would take the apple and, and run like hell. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrifying. I mean, I was terrified. It was just too scary. And then she had, um, she also had a friend who really would get into this with her. And the friend would be out in the garden, the garden. and scream, you know, terrible wailing screams in the garden. <laughs> Even though I knew it was all fake, it terrified me the whole thing. And she liked that. Now, how much of that was Ernest Thompson Seton? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if he had these ceremonies, these rituals. He well, he definitely had movie. rituals. He did have rituals. He did have rituals. Absolutely, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's the mama was terrified of speaking in public. She was very afraid. She learned a little bit, but she never did get, like it, get used to it. Hmm. 
So that that was just, you know, totally different. Whereas um, uh, my grandmother certainly was used to it. She was, you know, the kind of lady who ran organizations. Having these uh, Halloween-y kinds of activities, uh, were you and your siblings with you? Were, were there friends with well, you? Yeah, I, everybody, everybody was. Uh, there would be probably, you know, that because I, I would have been pretty young. And this was, yes, it would be for children and, and, and friends, but really it was for mom. <laughs> she just loved, loved to do this. And um, I, I, I was young and probably and would, too scared to, to be much involved. I remember one quite late uh, Halloween where I I was I went walked into the living room below that you know the newer that part of the house and I was I was by myself for some reason and there sitting in the chair was my grandmother who didn't move didn't say anything. And I was terrified. <laughs> a little bit about your, um, about Pam and, and Seton. Uh, you were the youngest, right? Yes, I'm, I'm right. They were my half siblings, about six and eight years older. Oh. And um, of course, I adored them. And just uh, particularly my brother, uh, various big publishing, a couple of publishing companies. Mm -hmm. You were in contact with her. You must have that information. Anyway, Blythe will fill you in. You, there's still plenty of work to do. And I look at all these books, my heart. <laughs> yes, there is a lot of work to do. And that's why we're, that's why the Institute is reestablished is to get people to help do that work. And then what? Well, it brings forward his philosophies, his work, um, I'm finding that people don't remember him. In the scouting arena, there are generations who don't know the name Ernest Thompson Seton, have no clue that he helped found the Boy Scouts. Uh, it, it was just drilled and um, that's a, a, a focused word on Baden-Powell, the drilling mm -hmm. Art. In this country, they did? Yes, even in this, country. in this country. In my research, I find that uh, after about 50 years, the people who did the real foundational work mm -hmm. are simply forgotten. The, re the references go away. Uh, and so, so it sort of became my mission to do that. Even though Seton said in the in the foreword of one of his books, it says, I've created the start and I'm happy to have done that because it's for new generations to continue this work. And we just need to get back to doing that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how you invigorate uh, something like that, how you use something like that information. I mean, how do you reintroduce these ideas and what, what do you do with them? In the organization, well, yeah. doing this webcast uh, is a start of that. Um, if you tune in on Saturday, uh, you'll hear the interview that we've done with Chris Brackley, who is, in fact, bringing that, a lot of that Seton philosophy forward. He found he founded his own little program on uh, wilderness survival things he called Earth Lore. And so he ties this to Seton's work and it, it's really quite fascinating. Well, that's great. No, that's that's where it's at. That's where it should be at. And yeah. also, for the moment, I've lost the, the word for the uh, sacred Indian room chamber that he created at Santa Fe, at Santa Fe and yes. that involved indigenous philosophies and religion. Yes. Yeah, so how is that being used and incorporated? It is, um, 
going back to its natural state, which is letting it just dissolve. Uh, the, the Academy, of course, has that property and they invited some of the, the elders from Pueblo to come and investigate. Uh, and they weren't very happy that Seton had, was allowed to build that structure outside of the, the indigenous community. And they said the best thing to do, you don't rebuild it, don't do anything, let it go back to the earth. I mean, it was barely usable when I left mm -hmm. in the late 70s. Um, and it just continued to deteriorate, both the Kiva and the Hogan. I know very little about um, ETS's actual relationship to local indigenous people They're in Santa Fe and around Santa Fe and how that played out how that was used. I know, I know Julie was much about how with him, involved with him in that. Yes, uh, they were both very involved at a very personal level. They were considered family. Um, my mom was considered family. And I'm sure we were too, but you know, uh, Seton had, had Indian names in at least four different uh, four different nations, mm. and your mother did too. Actually, your mother had um, an Indian name that was given to her. She was called Anya Tika at somewhere at what some point. Yeah. Well, you own an incredible career in archaeology and the preservation of antiquities. Was any of that? Um, do you think perhaps even subliminally? influenced by Ernest Thompson Seton? I'd like to say yes, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, I, no I, I, first, first of all, it's ancient. And I, he, I've never noticed that he had any particular interest in, in ancient, ancient anything. And that was, uh, no, I, I, I was interested in, in the ancient world and I was an art historian and I became involved in this hemisphere because of a professor that came from Yale and taught when I was a student and changed my whole direction from um, medieval studies to this hemisphere. And that, that, that's how it, it happened. I don't have any sense of, um, I'm, first, first of all, I doubt if ETS really thought much about the destruction of ancient peoples. I mean, that's the least of his problem. If you're not focused on that, uh, a lot of people don't even know or care very much. It's, I don't think that, that, I don't think that had, unfortunately, any, any, uh, any connection. No, um, I, 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 you know, I got it and got, into all of it by mistake when I realized what was happening to this new field I had just adopted was being you know, ripped out and, st and stalled and become on the market. And can, can you describe a little bit of that, um, what, what you experienced, what, you, what your impressions were about those losses of um, the exploitation and then also the tremendous things that you've done that are still um, uh, in, in legal precedent of um, preservation and some of the laws associated with it that you've helped create. That's fascinating. Well, I, I came as far as, uh, this, these are mostly uh, anthropologists who are involved in all this, and yeah. I came out of nowhere. I was an art historian, and there's a lot of hating about art historians. And it, it was because I, saw in the journals I was looking at these things which had clearly been just, you know, were destroying sites from being sold in New York City. It was, a, it was just this sudden awareness of, my God, this is what's happening right now here and nobody cares. Nobody, uh, it, it, also, I, I, it, it was unusual that that kind of attention was given in, in this hemisphere rather than in Greece or you know, more obvious 
ancient remains. Mm -hmm. And so it had perhaps attracted another whole sphere of interest like anthropologists and archeologists who were in this hemisphere and saw that their own uh, fields were, or understood the degree to which their own fields were threatened. Also uh, in this country, we have, from 1902, the, uh, we had our own legislation trying to protect New Mexico and the American Southwest, which was something, something and it was not great. It all goes on still, but that, that so that in this country, there were already precedents for this kind of legislation. It took a long time, but we finally got international legislation to uh, help with the problem. It goes, everything goes on, of course. It's all um, mixed in with the drug trade and in, in this hemisphere. You know, yes. if, you're, if you're trafficking one thing, you might as well traffic another at the same time. So, so uh, I think most people trafficking drugs are not very interested in this, but sometimes it's possible to use the same mechanisms. Well, the, the criminal organizations will try to uh, traffic anything that makes them money. Well, yeah, but, but think of the kind, different kinds of money we're talking about. Yes. <laughs> this is, gun, guns and drugs are quite something different. This is piddly stuff. From the point of view of the story, and this is so in, incredibly destructive, and the others are destructive to us, to human beings, and to the world today. Whereas that is only destructive to our past, and who cares? You know, <laughs> people are not don't get too excited about that. Thank you very much for your contributions today. It's been a pleasure. I would be happy if I can find more. For and if I do, I will let you know. Oh, please do. Please do. <laughs> Without further ado, we are pleased to introduce our featured guest. Mr. Chris Brackley, great, great nephew of Ernest Thompson Seton, who is joining us from Algonquin Provincial Park, north of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. Mr. Brackley is the lead cartographer at As the Crow Flies Cartography and at Canadian Geographic, the flagship publication of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society. Chris, thank you for joining us today. Chris, tell us a little bit about your uh, relationship to Ernest Thompson Seton. Um, well, I, uh, I grew up with my grandparents. My, uh, my, my uh, mother's parents uh, were Thompson. Um, so I knew that uh, the name was very, were very present in my world. And uh, the summer cottage that I went to every, for a month every year in Algonquin Park was bought by um, my grandparents Thompson, um, Cameron and Esther Thompson. Um, and so I knew about Seton, I knew about his books, um, we read them as kids, and we, you know, there was always the, um, that beautiful, there was a beautiful coffee table book about Seton that I would always thumb through to see the, um, uh, mostly the images, um, uh, curious about the sketches and drawings of woodcraft at the back of that dot, that tome, but I never I never really did get deep into it until later in life. Um, so I had this sort of um, a bit of a fuzzy sense of who he was and that he was connected. That we I was we were somehow connected to a somewhat famous person. This was in my in my headspace, but it wasn't until um, I set off on a on a uh, post high school uh, road trip across the United States that I um, that I really. Uh, was curious to know more about him. I guess I had read a biography that suggested that he had uh, settled it down in outside of Santa Fe and that Seton Castle was down there. And when I when I put the dots together and, and, and learned that that was probably still there, um, the fire was in me to go and, and see it and, and connect with it. And so at age 18, uh, with a friend and a fellow we'd picked up at the bus station, we knocked on the door um, of Seton Castle uh, and D opened the door, his daughter, and you know, she asked who I was and what my connection was. And uh, as soon as I was able to point myself out on a family tree, which I swear she had right at hand, it almost feels to me like she reached over and grabbed the family tree and said, point to where you are. 
there I was, and in we were let, and uh, spent three or four days just enjoying the the space and the comfort and the and and all of the artifacts. My goodness, there were things everywhere around, and that was an explosion of an understanding of of the the richness and the wealth of this this person. Um, and hearing it directly from D, of you know stories and tales about all the things woodcraft uh, to the to the continuation of his legacy, etc. So that was the fire, and and really that trip, um, I was trying to decide what program I would go into in university. I'd been accepted to a wildlife resources degree at McGill University. And I said, well, animals, Seton, it was all swirling around in my head. And I went ahead and, and, and went off to McGill University to study wildlife resources. And, and I know that that connection was there. Um, I was baked into where, where all of that went. Um, it wasn't long after that. Well, I suppose it was. I guess it was at the end of my... Um, uh, university career, I was looking to do more, um, more, more engaged, uh, broader work at the summer camp that I've been going to for 12 or 15 years by that point. And they, the nature educator had retired and having done a science degree and being so interested in nature and all things natural, um, though really not a good student, to be honest with you. I mean, I was, I was studied in the science uh, through my, my education, but um, that sort of field naturalist view of the world hadn't been mine necessarily. And uh, through a, a, a course on plants where I had to create a plant collection and learn about the plants, I, I went to my beloved Algonquin to do that collection. And I started, the world started to open up, not unlike Seton, now he was about five in the Don Valley when he was, his world was opening up and learning about all of these things. But I was starting to identify and make sense of, of uh, the forest uh, that I knew so well from experience from a lifetime of being in the park, but suddenly having a few names to attach, starting to see the patterns, starting to see the forests, uh, allowed me to generate uh, inspiration for uh, an outdoor education program that I called Earth Lore at, uh, at my summer camp, Camp Pathfinder in Algonquin. Um, and it was a really immersive um, uh, nature. I mean, it, it wasn't as directly influenced by Seton in a literal sense. I wasn't using uh, woodcraft um, uh, games and activities specifically. Uh, but in truth, at the very core of it, and I think when you go right back to, to where some of these ideas come from, really digging into nature, sitting quietly in nature for long periods of time, just receiving, letting it sort of flow over you. This was the very core of the program that I created. I, I, I wasn't as interested in games and activities, though we had lots. I was more interested in getting the kids deep into the forest to open their eyes. It was a five senses, receive the world, let it flow into you. Um, and this really, in the for the exact same motivation, I think, as Seton had, which was seeing a world that was disconnected from nature. Um, there's no question that, that, that his passion um, for reconnecting people with nature came from the joy that it brought him. He obviously had an internal drive that was unstoppable to connect with the natural space, but he saw that the disconnection from nature was a sort of a social ill that he thought could be remedied by more connection to being outside. And so as much as, you know, his, his interest in, um, in Native Americans and, and First Nations people resonated with me, at, at, at the deepest level, and I was just rereading some of his, his you know, introductions to some of his books about getting outside, you know, I, I think his view was that humanity has always sat around fires and been in nature. And it's been a very short time that we have not been sitting around fires and in, in absolutely integrated with and connected to and at one with nature. It's been, you know, it's three, four, five, six hundred years, call it what you will. 2000 years even, but for the long wealth of humanity, there we were in nature and that there's something that we need to do to get back to reconnection. Whatever that tool, whatever that method is, was, was really, I think, a goal that he had. And organically for me, it became a passion for me as well. The tagline for my mapping company as the crow flies cartography is reconnecting people with place. And that is, you know, from from a standpoint of cartography, place is sort of a, a view of the land at a broader scale than a human experience. Place to me is 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 home or its province or its state. It's a bit of a place is a is a bigger place on the earth. 
but that starts and is rooted always to me in a very real connection with the maple trees right in front of you or the inchworm that's crawling by and all of those kinds of things that way of building a, a very human experiential connection to the place that you're in and then broadening that out to see that you are connected to a world a community and indeed the whole planet these are the kinds of motivations that that stimulate me and and, and i really do feel are highly parallel with uh, a lot of the motivations that Seton had. That's excellent. Um, his his woodcraft. Um, how does that relate? Do you think with your program? Is there a connection between the two, um, either overt in in your development of your program, or um, perhaps uh, consequential or or um, um, unintentional uh, connection. Well, you know, the, the most amazing uh, thing uh, in my camp career as a long time and very devoted person to my summer camp, Camp Pathfinder in Algonquin Park, um, was the day, you know, 12 years on in my career there that I found an old brochure lying around. The camp was started in 1914. And when I found a, a brochure on sitting on a, on a desk somewhere and I looked at it, it said Camp Pathfinder, a woodcraft camp for boys. <laughs> and I, I said, what? Because I knew what woodcraft was uh, by this point, but I did not connect the dots to see that Camp Pathfinder was started with a route towards woodcraft as something of a model. Now it was started by outdoor uh, rec, you know, I mean, gym teachers, I think out of uh, Buffalo and Rochester. It was, I highly doubt it was ever a pure woodcraft camp, but that it was billed as such to begin with. And that indeed there's, there remain uh, some of the, some of the individual bits and pieces. The, the council fire remains at Camp Pathfinder uh, to this day. Noonway is a, is a classic greeting that, that is uh, given by all Pathfinder uh, folks. We sing the Omaha tribal prayer to close um, uh, council fires. Uh, these are the bits that are still there. We are, as any camp would do in the modern age, still looking at what is the right way to continue on with his legacy and uh, recognizing that we are changing our views about how we can use and reuse uh, indigenous um, practices. Uh, so we're not sure where we're all gonna land on all of that, but that the education is rooted, uh, that the, the program has roots uh, in, uh, First Nations connection to land will remain. We have a good contact now with a local Indigenous uh, uh, person of the Algonquin Nation, and we are working to revamp and bring that to a to a place uh, that sits uh, in correctly in the modern world. And we're all evolving on that. I'm not sure where that's going to land. But to get back to to Seton um, and and outdoor education in general, the thing I suppose when I, I mean there's so many so many arcs uh, to his influence in my mind anyway true or imagined i'm not sure but one is that's very seems hard to refute is that uh you know I, I remember being shocked by reading the numbers that i don't know when it was 1906 there were 200,000 people or something enrolled in woodcraft um that it was a big deal at the turn of the century it was a really big deal uh something that is just not in anyone if you're not connected to seaton you just wouldn't know uh the significant influence i suspect in that first decade of the 1900s that it it had quickly not quickly but slowly to be more uh, sort of overwhelmed by the boy scout um uh approach as woodcraft waned in boy, uh, boy scouts and, and in girl scouts and scouting sort of uh, uh grew but the fact that that is there at, at the turn of the century and the fact that the summer camp movement if it is a movement that the existence of summer camp starts to happen 1906 is the first summer camp in algonquin park 1914 is my summer camp in algonquin park and they continue on through the, the teens and 20s uh, in great proliferation and throughout the province this is my understanding this is my uh, this is my world and i'm sure that was happening throughout north america but the idea that kids should get outside in groups and be in nature together for recreation, revitalization, all of the goals that Seton had, is it's taken for granted that it's a thing that you do during the summer. But that Seton was a significant influence on the creation of that massively important to me and so many people, camp. I, I'm sure there are scholars of the history of camp that may 
you know, let me know about other influencers, and I'm sure there were many, but I, I doubt there were more, there was any one individual who had a greater individual influence on the growth of get outside, connect with nature. It's a positive thing. And so in a way, when I think about um, Seton's can, legacy, you know, I then, whatever it is, 90 years later, am able to invent an outdoor education program at a summer camp because the summer camp exists. That's, that's, you know, at the core of so much of it. My outdoor education program, Earth Lore, was rooted a bit more in a 70s. Uh, Sunship Earth, Steve Van Mater is a, uh, a highly influential outdoor educator. Uh, and he had a vision um, of uh, a distillation which really appealed to me in terms of structure. He looked at the world through a real ecology. Uh, and ecology wasn't even a thing when Seton was around. And so this idea of cycles and circles uh, of, of, of patterns of nature, of diversity as a positive, um, uh, just a general conceptual goodness of interconnectedness. Interconnectedness was the very core uh, of the program that I created, that all things are interconnected. And this idea, of course, is baked into uh, uh, a Native American or a First Nations worldview uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and it's certainly baked into woodcraft as well. Um, but that was where the core of my program went. But I, I think I will always um, have a, a real root appreciation of the fact that the whole reason I could ever even do such a thing, that I had a summer camp experience, some, some real piece of that goes back to Seton and his vision for the fact that this was a good thing for kids to do. That's remarkable. Taking a look at, the, at the, that period in which um, the proliferation of summer camps uh, was, was taking off during the industrial age, what's the correlation today with the digital age? And in particular, um, what kind of, of impressions have you experienced in the youth you've worked with in the digital age as you brought them out into um, our wild habitat and had them experience, as you described a little bit ago, the, the, the washing over and silence of appreciation of their space, but also in terms of their interaction. What kinds of things have you experienced in their transformation today? I, I mean, it, 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 it's always, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a feel good experience. I don't know what it is. It's an experience whenever you take kids out into a natural space. And when I would set up my natural uh, outdoor experiences with, uh, with the kids at my camp was really rooted in one thing. I mean, I had these trappings of different activities and things, but in the end, it really came down to, we're gonna paddle to the shore. We're gonna go somewhere where there's no trail and we're gonna make them take a map and a compass. We're gonna look at where we're going and we're going right into the bush and we're not, really going anywhere we're just going into the forest if we go 100 meters on in the next four hours i would say tell the kids that's great we're not trying to get anywhere we will have a destination in mind with our compass and we usually got there a bog or a lake or a river or something like that a cliff but the point is absolutely the journey and the intention is that we open our five senses and we receive as much as we possibly can as we walk through the forest and, and immediately what would start to happen is a kid would say, what is this over here? Look, and they'd find a mushroom. They'd find a crawling creature of some kind. And we'd all gather around and have a look at it. Um, I eventually got really less and less interested in naming things. I wasn't that keen on that. I was mostly keen on being sure that they were seeing something, that they were getting excited about what they were seeing. But what happened inevitably was that the kids would get excited about it. It wasn't there was no pulling of teeth. There was no challenge to get them into going out into the forest. And I think you can read this in the very first account of the, the first uh, Seton's first woodcraft boys uh, and his outside in Connecticut that when the structure was set up right and the kids were in the right context, it was a natural. There was nothing difficult about getting kids inspired to do it. And exposure and experience is the only thing in my you know, humble experience of doing this that that I think is 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 a necessary to to take kids out of a stuck on tech kind of a, a headspace. You got to get out. You got to do it. But it, it just was. I mean, if the bugs were terrible, it might be a challenge. But beyond that, that 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 innate interest in natural spaces and the richness of it, 
it was almost always um, a surprisingly easy experience. And it's funny because, uh, you know, it's actually really pretty hard to walk through a forest in Ontario. In many cases, it can be pretty thick. It's a pretty, it's a pretty, it's it's immersive to the point of discomfort, arguably at at times. Um, but not even that really got kids down. And we even took not not camp kids, but school groups from all all, all kinds of places, all kinds of backgrounds. And it was pretty much the same experience every day. I'm sure not every kid loved it, but no kid fought against it. And I think that basic innate uh, ease with which people can reconnect with nature, you know, is, is, is it, it just is. And, and I, as ever, hope that more and more kids get the opportunity to, to have an experience like that. So following up on that, uh, I'm thinking about my own grandkids and, and how they react to nature, although I haven't witnessed it myself. Um, do you think that the kids who really who may not have been as excited about it went along with it because they were with other kids and it wasn't being dictated to them by an adult leader one of the one of the things that Seton was really um, involved with was understanding the instinct that was particularly being developed at that particular age group, whatever that age group might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, 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 I think I take hugely from uh, Seton's uh, structural uh, approach to taking kids into the woods, which was kids are in charge. It's their motivation. It is not, it's not a top down, really is a bottom up kind of a view of, uh, of, of experience. Now, at the camp I was at, it's, it's a canoe tripping camp. And there's no question that the canoe tripping structure is remains quite hierarchical in order that it be safe. Uh, there are a lot of risks when you go out on a canoe trip so that there there's undoubtedly a, a different structure there. But I guess what was exciting for me was that I wasn't doing canoe trips in this context. I was taking them on immersive experiences into the woods. And that was an open space. And, and I really do think the idea of not slowly moving away it's interesting because I obviously Seton thirsted to know um, what things were called to understand the structure that was an early part of his interest in his education um, but when I when I stepped away from I mean it's sort of a hybrid kind of view of, of things that he, he would have done when I stepped away from telling kids what was happening here's this this is part of this ecological structure and this is in this place in the food chain and this is its name and on and on and on it was just wow isn't that what is look at that color my goodness where does that color come from that was my only reaction which is to say whatever you just did jimmy or bob or whatever is amazing look at look at what you've done so it was really whatever their interest was was where my support went and that um and and my interest in their, their interest sparked the other kids to be interested and on it would go and it was just a sort of a uh a, a fire of uh, uh, sharing, really, in a lot of ways that that continued to grow uh, over the course of the day while we were walking. Of course, we'd start to get tired and things would change, but that it was always the first hour or so that was just full of explosive finds. Um, and I, I don't know, I maybe maybe it was the fact that we had a, a big gang that allowed uh, allowed more things to be found. Sure it is more eyes and more more ears and more senses attuned to what was happening but we used to find like full moose skeletons in the forest we used to find remarkable finds and i must say i've been out with my kids a lot lately and and we haven't found all the things that i managed to find back in the day so who knows maybe 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 it takes a group to really uh to absorb the fullness of a place i'm not sure interesting that's that's fantastic <laughs> and and when you say that um, what's going through my mind is the trip that you took me on in Algonquin Park when I was um, after a very long conference. <laughs> that was great. Thank you very, very much. And for now, I think we'll say goodbye. Joe? Thank you very much. You bet. It was great. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.